Trigger warning. This podcast contains discussion of emotional, physical, and sexual abuse, and includes explicit language. Listener and viewer discretion is advised. Not defined by what happened when I was 12, but certainly it was like, it has been like the hugest assignment of my life to make peace, to find understanding, to find forgiveness, and to find self-love. Without healing, traumatic experiences can have an enormous impact on defining who we are and who we will become. Wade Robson and myself, James Safechuck, are both survivors of childhood abuse. In this podcast, we're talking with survivors, trauma specialists, and advocates. Highlighting the many resources available in order to inspire the brave steps to starting or continuing the healing journey. This is From Trauma to Triumph. Hey everyone, welcome to our podcast, From Trauma to Triumph, with myself, Wade Robson, and James Safechuck. Today we have a, an amazing, beautiful, and talented guest by the name of Martin Moran. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about him. Um, Martin is a highly successful actor in theater, television, and film, and an award-winning author. His Broadway performances include Cabaret, Titanic, Spamalot, Bells Are Ringing, Big River, How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying, and A Christmas Carol. He also has many off-Broadway television and theatrical credits to his name. When Martin was 12 years old, he was manipulated by camp counselor into what became a three-year sexual abusive relationship. Years later, Martin wrote a book about his experiences during and after the abuse. The Tricky Part, A Boy's Story of Sexual Trespass and A Man's Journey to Forgiveness, which won multiple literary awards. Martin was also awarded an Obie and two Drama Desk nominations for his one-man play, The Tricky Part, based upon his memoir. Martin, so happy to have you with us. Thank you for being here. Huge pleasure, as you guys know. I'm really, really happy to be with you guys. Let's begin with, I guess the hard question. (laughs) If (laughs) you can just sort of give us and and the audience a bit of a, you know, summary of your life story. Sure, I I will. And I and I um, just also by way of greeting to say to you, to the you, all of you out there who are listening and to to Wade and James, that um, whatever instinct brought you here to be listening, whatever that voice is inside, uh, uh, I'm just, I'm, I know we're all moved that you're, you know, have the courage to come and listen and that whatever that curiosity is, I mention this because it's the thing I feel tender about this solidarity of us moving through this mystery together, this journey of healing. Yeah. Um, and I love this, you know, from trauma to triumph. And I'm coming to you today, all of you listeners from New York City, my apartment uptown in Manhattan. I'm 62 years old. And it occurs to me just as I was walking this morning that um, it was on April 7th, 1972, when I was pulled into a sleeping bag at a camp in the mm-hmm. Colorado Rockies. And that so happens to be <laughs> 50 years next week or two next, I mean, coming right up in a couple weeks, 50 years ago. So here I am sitting in my Manhattan apartment, a grown up fella married to my husband, Henry for 37 years. And I'm aware that, um, you know, what I'd like to do is take just a few minutes to give you a thumbnail of the, what happened Mm -hmm. when I was a boy. Um, and of course, and that's in the context of sitting with you guys right now as a guy with a full life in New York City, who many times, as I've said to you guys, I don't want to talk about this anymore. I'm I'm done with this story, but I'm not. And that's okay. In fact, it's more than okay, because it continues to be a source of learning and a source of sort of divinity and meeting you guys and speaking to whoever's listening right now. And um, so I... 
I just feel a great, anyway, I feel a lot of heart around this about whoever is called to listen. Hello from New York. <laughs> and beautiful. just to say, I grew up in Colorado, in Denver, Colorado, an amazing place to grow up, beautiful nature, a lot about hiking and skiing and mountains. And uh, to give a little context of family of four kids, a mom and a dad, dad was a writer for the paper, the Rocky Mountain News, and mom, a homemaker, and worked later on. But it was a difficult family. There was alcohol. There was, uh, it was super, super Catholic and conservative. And so I always had a sense, as I look back on it now, that we were like orbiting uh, each other, but there wasn't real communion. There wasn't super mm -hmm. connected intimacy and communication. So I, and I knew from a very young age that somehow I was, I was haunted by feeling different and I didn't, couldn't put a name to that, but it definitely had to do with the fact ultimately that I was born homosexual. And, mm -hmm. um, that was, uh, a, a terrific burden. Um, in a super Catholic family, I went to Christ right. the King <laughs> elementary school. I went to Regis all boys Jesuit high school. So there was a kind of intense loneliness and an intense panic as comes from a kind of dysfunctional house where you, and, and I chose the role of being the pleaser and the caretaker and the perfect little boy getting A's. That was my way of getting through. And suddenly yeah. this perfect little boy was invited by a neighborhood friend to go up and work on a camp for a weekend, a ranch, a boys camp. Uh, and, oh, I love the crow there. I mean, the, the cop, there's a, there's a, a rooster crowing in the background. I love it so much <laughs> in, in, in where Wade lives. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of the ranch I was invited to in the mountains. Um, there's this kind of amazing feeling of being invited. And I knew the guy slightly because he, the guy who was starting this boys camp on a ranch in the mountains, I had met at camp St. Malo, which was a Catholic boys camp, very well known in the Colorado Rockies. Lo and behold, I got permission. I got someone to cover my paper route. I didn't have to go to Sunday mass. I got permission on all fronts. And on a Friday, uh, April, April, uh, 1972, I went up in this big truck up into the mountains and there was elk and there were stars and there was beautiful. It was incredible. And this guy was like a, had been the, the great hike leader and this charismatic man who I had thought was a seminarian, but turned out he was a, an employee of this camp. Most mm -hmm. of the camp counselors at Camp St. Malo were seminarians, but it was a definitely a deeply Catholic place. He worked there for several summers. So that's what gave my parents, I think, and, every, and me and everyone else, hey, this guy is comes from Camp St. Malo, and he's now starting right. his own camp. And that night, um, 12 years old, and uh, just to, you know, I never had a, I didn't have a hair on my body. I didn't, I knew something was going to come. I'd read about the uh, having a wet dream, perhaps, in the back of the scout book, I'd read about it. Guys, mm -hmm. you know, I'd heard things the way you do when you're a kid, but I was a kid. And had not had any sexual experience, nor was I at all mature. I didn't know, you know, my body was still kid body. And uh, this guy pulled me into his sleeping bag that night when my, my, my other friend was there and he was asleep across the way and, and molested me. And that, you know, we could get into talking more about what that is or what that means at some point, but essentially, um, he, you know, rubbed himself against me or between my legs and came, which was like, oh my God, what it was all new. It was all just, you know, it was overwhelming and it was yeah. everything about it. And in so do, and I was overwhelmed by the, the, all the feelings I was having, including like, oh my God, there's so much about this that feels so powerfully. I'm so drawn to the, the being touched and being held and being, paid attention to. And, uh, and the, and part of this first experience was that, um, he also, you know, was after he came, he was playing with me and I was like, Oh, st 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 I got to get out of here. I don't know what's happening. And I thought I had to pee because I didn't know what was happening. And I suddenly had my first orgasm and I knew what it was when it happened. And I, and so part, part of, part of this whole context is in that very moment, that was it. 
I was damned. I, I, uh, I let it happen. I allowed it to happen. And from that moment forward, here I am 50 years old, I would say that that initial experience, the intensity of it, the mystery of it, the way it's held in my child brain and in my body memory has been a kind of portal, a wound, um, an obsession, a puzzle, mm. a lifelong mystery to unfold. And I almost didn't make it. I, I uh, you know, had to sort out so many things about that. And I also returned to this man's arms over a three year period again and again, and usually mm. in the mountains, usually on an adventure, rafting, glacier sliding, sometimes with other boys. I was aware at some point that there were other boys. So it was quite uh, a tangled mess, fucked up mess. And meanwhile, I was pulling straight A's and trying to shine and uh, get myself to Stanford, which I ultimately did. And I, and that's when things really began in my early twenties. I was, you know, it was suicidal. I was a lot of, and I couldn't put my finger on it. And it took me many, many years of writing and talking and thinking and meditating and therapy. And I'm here at 62 with a rich and full life defined by many different things and also, uh, fueled and, uh, not defined by what happened when I was 12, but certainly it was like, it has been like the hugest assignment of my life to make peace, to find understanding, to find forgiveness and to find self-love, which is the deepest and longest journey of all of this is you know, self self-love. Right? Absolutely. I'll stop yeah. there for the moment. <laughs> wow. Thank you for sharing. You bet. You, you mentioned that you felt different early on, uh, feeling like, I don't know if you knew you were homosexual or if you even understood what that meant when the abuse started. Did, did you? Did you understand what that meant or did you have any inkling that you, that you were homosexual? I had an inkling. Absolutely. I couldn't put it into language exactly. I knew that I had that for me, boys in my class, older, slightly older boys were like, um, they were like a furnace or a fire that I just wanted to be near. I wanted to be noticed by, I wanted to be loved by, I wanted to be hugged by, you know, I, there was no hugging in my house. There was no, my dad yeah. was a wonderfully kind man, but really, really not there, you know, not, not, not capable of intimacy on some level. Yeah. Uh, because of his own stuff, whatever that was. And uh, he was quite the drinker and just not there. And although, yeah. Yeah. you know, and I say that with, you know, I had a roof, I had food, I had, you know, they paid for my education. They were really good people who are, were, you know, you, look, the three of us have spent years attempting to wake up, you know, and, and to wake up to ourselves, to wake up to, be what it is to be alive, to be present. And, uh, you know, I'm sorry to say that that wasn't, my dad somehow didn't have the tools for that. So this is just uh, to answer your question, James, somewhere in my very deep being, I knew that I was what you would call gay or homosexual at the time, knowing also too, that it was absolute damnation if that were true. So I, right. so a huge part of my energy was spent burying that and hiding it and mm. denying it and uh, right so that had that had been expressed to you explicitly that being homosexual was a sin or however it was worded like uh, over and over again oh god yes oh god yes yeah yeah, yeah. Ab ab right. ab damnation yeah right. absolutely uh you know it was in the bible it was in the air it was in the <laughs> you know, you hear cracks, you hear things. And it was also just a matter of being, um, you know, all those things, perhaps a little light in the loafers, perhaps a little playful and sensitive, perhaps, a, you know, I didn't play ball. I didn't. Um, but certainly as a little kid, uh, it was a deep feeling. It really wasn't until I was in college that I sat down one day and I went, okay, this is it. You are, you're gay. Mm -hmm. 
when the abuse is starting, mm-hmm. uh, oftentimes the sexual abuse, you know, I would imagine for, for a lot of people, there's good feelings involved. There's good physical feelings involved. You know, being touched yeah. just feels good. You also, you know, in many cases, want to please your abuser. Mm-hmm. You love them mm-hmm. in many ways. How did that play out, This the, the good feelings of the abuse, plus then... I would imagine feeling guilty or feeling shameful for some of the pleasurable feelings about the abuse as well. How, how did you, how did your sort of little mind wrap its head around that at that early stage? Yeah. Little mind is, you know, our, our dear child brains trying to make sense of everything. It yeah. was a basic chaotic storm inside my mind. Mm. I knew, you know, it's so powerful touch, so powerful the pleasure of it. It's a, you know, it is, we've grown older and realized, you know, this is a, 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 a profound divine energy, erotic energy. It's just so huge. And when you're a little kid, it's, it's there, it's powerful. It's overwhelming. And that's why, you know, as I've so often said, as you've heard, you know, it's a kid's job to fall in love. It's a, right. an adult's job to have boundaries, period, period, period. Our abusers yeah. did not have know what boundaries were. They didn't, you know, they were kids themselves and and mentally or mature. But the James, to try to answer your question, the way it played out was with misery, with a lot of suffering that I had to hide. You know, I tried to date girls. I tried to go to the prom. I tried to just, you know, I tried to watch how I walked. I tried to Mm -hmm. watch how I held myself. I ran for class president. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the energy inside was was absolute um, anxiety. And I knew, I, I knew uh, the, ple- the pleasure you talk about is so confusing. It, it was, you know, wanting to be touched, wanting to be, and, but I realized too, there would be other guys around and I was attracted to them. And then I would think, is this because of how I, what have happened with my abuser, abuser Bob? Did he make me that right. way? Is he made me more that way? Mm. How can I get away with, from this? I've got to, you know, I, I ultimately went to see a psychiatrist and, you know, I asked for this, I was 15 and I asked for psychiatry, you know, my mother was like, what's wrong? And I had one session with this guy and he said, I remember him saying, well, it's like a switchboard. Do you find that you do think about girls? I said, yeah. He said, well, every time you feel sexual, just plug the switchboard and start p- plugging girls in there. Mm. Instead of guy, you know, the guy was mm. obviously didn't know what he was doing. Yeah. I did at one point in the complex relationship with my abuser, I just said, you know, I, I said to him, I'm terrified that I'm going to be gay, homosexual. And that's, I'm going to be, that's going to be my life. And he said, no, no, no. You see what we have, we, we love each other. Homosexuals are people without love. And this is something I've written about too. It is so destructive. When you imagine all the levels of violence that are going on when you're in your kid brain, as you say, the ways you're trying to figure things out and you're trying to get information. So it, it was a, you know, it was a, it was deeply difficult and, you know, a, a recipe for, um, for suicide, really, for lack of a better word, which I attempted twice as a, as an adolescent. And just to say too, with you guys, you mentioned the sort of complexity and love and, you know, I'm very aware that the, each of our experiences is so different. Somebody who's super young, even younger, like four or five, six, who are having to work and some people who have had that their experiences were absolutely violent, just physically violent. It was like a, I just want to acknowledge that that's a whole, whole other huge terrain that I can't imagine uh, sorting out in some ways. The violence of the terrain I've been in, I don't know about you guys, but part of the unpacking of it is the profound complexity of something that you felt was nourishing at the same time and endured over time. Yeah. So that was part of the homosexual confusion as well. You know, Martin, first of all, just, I'm so sorry for what happened to you. And, you know, as, as James and I know, like it shouldn't happen to anyone. It shouldn't have happened to you. It shouldn't have happened to us and to so many people. Um, so I'm just sorry for that. And at the same time, I'm so glad you're here now. Yeah. And, you know, we've, we've known each other for a brief amount of time. Um, it's just the beginning, but 
already like i just see and and everyone else will learn as we talk more how much profound healing you've engaged in that you know that you've taken up the baton to engage in over your life and and so at the same time i'm just so grateful for those experiences of healing for you and that you're here with us now so thanks just want to for acknowledge that, that first and, and, and let me just slide in yeah. that you be, you just said that and it here i am at 62 and it absolutely fills my heart because mm -hmm. of a kind of recognition and love and it is love for one another i feel so warmly toward james you james and you wade so warmly and i really it's interesting uh, that you simply say that i'm that you're sorry and i'm, I'm just kind of like ah you know blah, blah. i'm right, really right. i'm really moved you you feel that way and that you say that and i really feel that and i appreciate that as a brother as a fellow soul and i'm sorry too that's mm -hmm. i think that's part that what you guys have gone through and what i took in and witnessed from what i know of your stories from the amazing brave film that you made and mm -hmm. are part of so thank you thank you thank you for that mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you yes yeah, so i one of my many 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 questions i guess would be how did the relationship with with your abuser continue to play out the best way to put it was here's a guy starting a ranch camp like a working ranch with animals and hiking trails up in the colorado rockies finding a context in which to draw young men young boys mm -hmm. uh, i see that now at the time it was his altruistic desire to teach us about uh, husbandry and you know and as i've said as i've written you know i learned the difference between a spruce and a cedar and a heifer and a holstein and a you know i cleared a field and <laughs> watched a calf being born you know these so to answer that question wade is to say there was a context where hey it's with for my parents and for myself this was the guy who had a place in the mountains and i loved it and i loved mm -hmm being up in the mountains and I loved the sense that I'm going to wield a hammer and I'm going to wear Levi's and I'm going to be a mm. guy. I'm going to be a man. Right. I mean, it's so paradigm. And so these trips were such that, Oh, Bob called and he wants to move the five horses from, um, uh, from Estes park to Allen's park. And it's through the backwoods and he wants you to come and da da da. Um, it, it became, and you know, I was 12 when I first met him, had my first orgasm. I literally over those three years that I uh, would go back and be with him became, uh, a young adolescent, a young, my body changed, you know, I grew mm -hmm. pubic hair. I grew, I had, I grew smells. I grew, I then understood what sperm was. I understood these desires I was growing into a man while I was in this illicit secret and so it involved trips or a trip to Wyoming for 10 days to mm -hmm. raft the Green River and camp out in the Tetons with on a bus with 15 other guys, uh, right. young guys. And, and and certainly stuff was happening with other guys. I sort of blocked it out or it sort of was unspoken. Nobody could speak about it. It, it gets more complex yeah. as we go because there was one guy I knew and i knew what was happening and we spoke about it once but that's all also too you know it's just there's so many side stories to this but i yeah. do want to throw in in terms of those three years just to add another layer of the complexity and violence that he i don't know what his story was in all of this but he was ambisexual he was a pedophile and he was also he slept with women a lot mm -hmm. and women loved him from what i could tell and he was you know he was a big guy he was a charismatic guy and he ultimately had a girlfriend whom i knew and who became his wife and they had a child and i um and i slept with her as well with mm. both of them and that became that was one of the episodes a, a few times in the and part of that again that violence was his sense that he wanted to teach me how to be a man oh yeah yeah and she was 19 he was in his early 30s i was 14 you know, so we're talking a triangle of, you know, of illness, deep illness. Yes. Um, mm. So 
over three years. And then a day came at, uh, when I was 15, almost 16, and I was in an all boys Catholic school and it was just so intense. And it was, I thought if I am ever having a chance to live and grow up and be a man, I have got to extricate myself. And I drove up there one night and there he was with his family. And I said, I have to talk to you. And I said, I never want to see you again. And I, I'm so ashamed of everything that's happened between us. And I think he was shaken. I think whatever, who knows, but that was my way of, and then it was many, many, many years before I ever spoke about it, brought it up again. Right. You've used the word mm -hmm. violent violence mm -hmm. quite a few times. Mm -hmm. And it really resonates with me because you know, when your abuse is wrapped up with love, your, your little, we'll go back to your little brain, doesn't understand the abuse as a violent mm -hmm. act. And you really don't see it that way for, for a long time. And sure. I know you mentioned that in your book that you don't, you didn't think of it as, as abuse or as violent, mm -hmm. but it is violent. Even yeah. even when it's wrapped up in the abuse, there is a violence to it, and I and even, I understand there's more a so, distinction, maybe. Mm -hmm. may even more so. And I understand there's a distinction between like I know you know some children are actually violently beaten, and I'm not talking about that sort of physical violence, but there's a violence to this kind of abuse that's that's not apparent to you or as a, as the survivor, because it's, you, you think of it so much as love and you're trying to remember back at, you know, how enamored you were with this person. Yes. And, but it is violence. And, and that, that's come to me recently. Mm -hmm. Like that idea that like, man, that was, that abuse was violence. That was, that was violence. It is. Yeah. And I think of both of you, I really do. I think of you and it's part of what I feel so tender about is that you're both parents, you're both fathers. But I do remember going to a Passover dinner at my Jewish friend's house and across from me sat a 12 year old boy. And that's, and I was maybe 17, 16, 17. And something so powerful hit me. And I looked at what 12, I forgot what 12 looks like. I forgot, right. you know, you don't realize yeah. your, your consciousness when you're a kid, you're like, you don't see it as violent, you know? you're just this consciousness in this body and you're exploring the world. And I realized what an act of violence it would be if I manipulated this beautiful 12 year old boy who was studying French and knew I spoke French and wanted to practice with me. And I thought, and I was so, I loved this boy. I met him and he was across mm -hmm. the table and I felt I wanted to take him in my arms and, and in a way taking him in my arms was, was looking at him and seeing God and feeling such deep respect. And the violence that we're speaking about is I think of each of you in your as, as seven, eight year olds, seven, eight year olds, however you are, and what you're experiencing with your children, the desire, the wish for this soul to move authentically in their own time to their act, their authentic being, and to not have that interrupted. It, you know, or or right. Uh, you know, to, to not, and, the, and I think I've only grown to use the word violent. Maybe I haven't really even used that word until I'm talking with you guys today. Cause I look back and I see how psychically and spiritually violent it was. And you spend a lifetime right. piecing it back together into a wholeness, you know, into, to, to me, the entire journey is about how to become more and more present to here and now and not, not getting the past from around my throat. <laughs> yeah, the the words using those words li like violent and I also comes to mind rape, which I didn't I didn't necessarily think of what happened to me as rape, but you cannot give consent as a child. And if somebody's having sex with you without consent, like isn't that rape? Like I don't that word doesn't come to mind at first, but now the the better understanding I have, I'm like this was violent. This was rape. This, this was, this was those things that I, I didn't associate with, with my abuse, but it really was. Yeah. I had a moment with that just to resonate early on in my healing process. Like once I had disclosed to my therapist in LA, the first person about the abuse. And once I had described to him, you know, what went on and what occurred and, and what Michael did, um, 
I remember him saying to me, like him kind of needing to say it to me plainly, you know, Michael raped you. Mm. And I had it, I kind of really pushed back from that. And I was not at that moment. I, that was not computing. I was still, I was immediately in this place of trying to have compassion for Michael already. Well, yeah, he had mm -hmm. a hard life and mm -hmm. he was abused and I was trying to skip right to that. Mm -hmm. Of course. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, and I was not ready at that moment to accept that yet, but it's, and, but I absolutely came to understand that to be so true, so deeply true. Um, it's, yeah. it's part of, it is part of that compassion you, you mentioned that you skipped to, to Michael. I think acknowledging the, the, the word rape, the act is also part of the self love. It's part of this is the gravity of what I went through and I'm here and I'm an amazing guy. I made it this, but, but I think it's part of taking in and, and, and deeply being, being, being deeply aware about what happened. I had the exact same thing mm -hmm. just from a technical point of view. I mm -hmm. literally would say to people, Oh, you know, he, I, I, I don't, you know, and I don't want to be, I, I'm going to be careful about being too graphic or anything, but I, the, you know, my perpetrator never penetrated me anally, but he did between my legs. That was his way. And I know that I think he did penetrate other others, but for whatever reason he did me, it was oral and, and between my legs. And so, so I had a whole idea that, oh yeah, this is just, you know, it's just, yeah, it's just not that big right. a deal. I, I've, I haven't been raped. I haven't been hurt right. that way. I, I, he didn't take my manhood or something like that or some, all these ideas, right. but right. bottom line, period, period. Rape. I was raped. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I mean, that's something I haven't said until the last few years of my life either, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to honor too that, like, as you mentioned, gosh, that the, the insane twisted juxtaposition, like within the story that you describe as far as, you know, what you were getting out of seemingly the relationship with your abuser, aside from the abuse. I mean, as far as this, calling to go do these quote unquote manly mm -hmm. things, right? These masculine things. And like you said, learn to become a man or a husband or whatever it may be. Um, while you're uh, struggling with your own uh, feelings of sexuality and wondering what that means and what does that mean about you being a, a man or a boy and also you being abused you know, sexually mm -hmm. by this man who's supposed to be the ultimate picture of masculinity, like just how much, you know, how confusing. Oh yeah, gosh, confusing. And I, that would be, and I do yeah. want to say for, you know, listeners and your, your audience here and for you guys as well, that, that part of that layer to a deep part of it was that all of this played out uh, culturally in a deeply Catholic context so that yeah. It wasn't, it was sort of went beyond the notion of criminal or secret or illicit. It basically, it was in my experience in my body and my spirit and my mind, that child brain you talk about. It was that I had in fact made a deal with the devil that I was, right. hmm. you know, I will be going to hell and the sorting out the damnation part of it, <laughs> you know, it's been a lifelong journey of healing. It's, I think, been part of what's led me much more deeply to delve into Eastern religions, Eastern mm -hmm. practices, to get away from the notion of a judgmental God, and much more to the divine, the divine energy of, of our oneness, even speaking here together today, you know, the ground of right. being that is creation and nature. And, uh, but just to say that, I think all of those yeah. things played a factor. And I'm sure for you guys, too, you're whatever culture you were a part of growing up, you know, either religiously or politically, everything becomes a secret uh, in the yeah. context of, you know, I think we hear about so much in the Orthodox Jewish community and the Catholic community and the Christian community and um, whatever kind of communities. And this is what, and it adds a kind of amazing, terrible secretiveness that is so much a part of the poison of what, what we've come through. Yeah. I think in the book you you mentioned you when you right about the time when you told your family you had this conversation with your sister mm -hmm. I believe and she uh, 
she mentioned something like the the abuse she knew about mm-hmm. Bob, which was your abuser, and Bob I think had went to jail mm-hmm. for abuse. So your your family knew about his history, but it wasn't quite talked about with your relationship with him. And your sister said something like the abuse made you gay. Yeah. At one point, at one point in, in, in our ignorance, in our, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And I, and I think, I mean, it's, it's the ignorance of people thinking that abuse, this kind of abuse, if, if you're, if you're abused by someone of the same sex, that, that, that that abuse makes you one way or mm-hmm. the other. Right. That and I think that that's like a common sexuality. belief, right. right? That determines it. But I guess my point is that it doesn't determine yeah. it. You know, you are who you yeah. are, but this abuse and people's understanding of it, you know, it's so complicated. And I think people really struggle with thinking that this abuse defines their sexuality. Yeah. And there's a lot of struggle with that for survivors. Yeah. Of sexual Hugely. abuse and you know particularly men i was talking about and uh it adds to the sense of ever being able to have a comfort you know to talk about to to sort out you know mm-hmm. i did something i did something gay i did something and and you know or, or i i'm gonna be gay and you know we're just coming into a period of time where we're not condemning in our right. culture anyway mm-hmm. homosexuality you know there are a lot of places i still travel or could travel where i would be killed or go to jail you know, for being married mm-hmm. to Henry or for be, you know, right. for my desire to have to, for, for men. And it's just such a deep part of our culture. And this does add, a, you know, a deep complexity to <laughs> sorting through a finding your, you know, a centered genuine life, you know, and, and feeling uh, good about yourself. I'm, you know, I work in the theater. I spent the early years of my theater career hiding, that I, I, I was like, I'm not going to get work. I'm going to be pigeonholed. I'm going to be, and I'm right. glad to say, you know, here I'm working musical theater. <laughs> it's sort of, you know, <laughs> it's just a one big happy family. I'm really glad to say, but that was many years in the making. Can you, do you think you can point to any point in your life where you feel like your healing journey began, mm-hmm. whether you knew it or not at the time? The notion of, You know, the magic human question, what happened? The story part of us, the, by, by, you know, there's a poet, uh, Mural Rukeyser used to say, we're not something like, we're not so much made of molecules as we're made of stories. It's the way our brains work. It's the way our, it's the way we exchange ideas. It's the way we understand things. So to answer that question, Wade, partly what I want to say is that um, when I was, almost 30, very close to 30, I um, was in a play in a musical, uh, uh, singing in the rain, playing the Donald, the Donald O'Connor part, flipping around. And I hurt myself badly. I, hurt, I, I uh, hurt my knee and I had knee surgery. And I went back home in order to um, recuperate because I didn't want to. And Henry thought it wasn't better, you know, from the subways and the city, New York City streets. So it was really a weird thing there. I was at 30, I was back in Denver and going back home always was like a landmine, the smells, the mountains. I didn't know why exactly, but it was like, Oh, I don't want to come back. And it had a lot to do with all this. And I was lying in bed and, um, I'd always journaled, but I was journaling and I was working on a script and I was, and literally the pen, I talk about this a little in the book, my pen just went, what happened when you were 12? Tell the truth. And something began then, which was a very long process of piecing together the narrative of what happened. Those two, that two magic words, what happened, what the fuck happened? And it was very secret. It was in a tiny journal. It was, but I, it was like somewhere stored in my body was the whole story from the point of view of, of my soul. So that I I began a journey of being able to share the story or, or understand the story by telling it to myself, wait, oh yeah, there was that I had, I had, you know, buried it so deeply for 15 years or more, you know, and some people even longer, 20, 30 years. 
But there was a point at which I was writing about it secretly. And then, you know, in this way of diminishing, I remember mentioning it to somebody. I was in a play and I was talking to the composer and I said to him, oh, yeah, yeah, that happened to me too. He was talking about how when he was in high school, this guy did. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, I don't want that. And he said, what? I said, well, when I was 12, there was this guy. And he's like, and he just turned to me and he said, geez, that's a big deal. And I said, ah, no, it's not a big deal at all. Hmm. But there was a moment when I began to write about it. And then, uh, I, you know, I'm going to just cut to, it's kind of this whole period of my early 30s. I'd met Henry when I was 24 and I was deeply sexually compulsive. I mean, I was sneaking around. I just was like, it was like so compulsive and I didn't understand. It was so painful. I, I just wanted, I just was ad ad addicted to anonymous sex, to just quick furtive anonymous. It was crazy and it was all hidden. Mm -hmm. And one thing led to another and I was, had been with Henry for seven years and I was going to break up with him. I was like, you know, I know it's not going to work. And, but I thought before I break up with him, I'm going to just talk to a therapist. And I went to her and I said, you know, I'm going to, I'm with this guy. He's a really good guy, but I think we're going to break up. It's been together seven years. I think I can do this in three sessions. And she said, oh, great. That's great intentionality. And <laughs> I don't know what happened or how exactly it happened, but she was the right person at the right time. I was th 35 years old. And suddenly there, are, I said something and about what happened and, oh, you know, not, I mean, she said, oh, you know, she said, would you do me a favor? Would you just bring in a picture of yourself when you were that age, when you were 12? I said, oh, that's so freaking corny. I don't want to, that's so silly. That's so, but I, and I did. And the next week I came and I had a picture of myself, the picture that's on the cover of my book that was taken by my perpetrator. And I set it on the couch. And she said, oh, tell me about that. Tell me about this day or tell me about this boy. And bam, Here's there the it picture. is. That's the picture. And a kayak. And this woman was the right soul at the right time who energetically was so present. And she just listened and didn't judge and out poured for the first time the complexity, the paradox, the pain, the, the mystery. And to this day, she is still my friend, my, you know, I'm 62 now and she's retired, but I still talk to her now and again. She, uh, she had a huge part of saving me in a certain way. She was so intelligent and sensitive about it. And yet too, it wasn't everything. It wasn't like the abuse was everything. There was, you know, the picture got bigger and bigger and bigger. Right. And when, when you mentioned that, that, that sitting down to write mm -hmm. that, that time, would you say that that was really the first time, um, maybe not any of it, but, or at least all of it had, or a good amount of it had exited your body, had exited your consciousness that you'd ever really told the story? Yes. But, and, but, and wait slowly, really, really slowly. You know, it was like the description of a fence. It was this description of the sky, the constellation. It was, oh, wow, we were walking across. It was like the, I had to write for a long time before I got to the loft with the sleeping bag. And, in, in, you know, it was like I was writing my way to the, to what felt like, what if we were going to call it trauma, we're going to call it the, the to, to the, the act, the, in the initial act, which then of course became an ongoing thing, but it was, there was a way in which it, it took me a long time to write my way toward, to just say, this is what happened. He pulled me into his sleeping yeah. bag. George was over there snoring across the room. He held me, he, you know, um, but that was buried for many, many years. And, but the, and the writing yeah. of it, and I don't know if anyone listening or, you know, whether you think of yourself as a writer or not, there's an incredible, there can be incredible healing power in, in just laying out your, your story from your own point of view. So there's a way by which you own it more, you own it. Mm -hmm. It's not something done to you. All of this is about so much of it I say is about it, that my journey has been about sort of getting is sort of shifting the point of view or the sense in my being of being a victim. Yes, there's a reality. I was, you know, I was a victim. 
they're, they're, you know, the guy mm-hmm. perpetrated this act on me. And there's a way, there's a whole reality in which my choice to live as a victim is totally mine. And it's a lifelong journey, but it's right. like, oh my God, this is the human experience, you know? And I, I'm not defined by being a victim. I'm not. Right. So if the initiation of your sort of expressed healing journey um, started to come through writing Mm -hmm. and and then speaking to this, you know, telling your story to this therapist, as you mentioned, it seems like that then continued to be a theme in your life and and in your healing journey, writing Mm -hmm. and telling your story is is that right how did that play out it's totally right yeah it's, it it is what happened <laughs> and mm-hmm. i'm as surprised as anyone on some level you know i i okay just going to say i know if you guys there you guys feel called at this point in your lives to do this podcast trauma to triumph yeah. there's something in you that mm-hmm. it's like the stuff you're working on deep in your soul which is freaking challenging and very solitary when you're in bed at night and you can't sleep or you're like, you know, it's this deep soul journey. What is it that then you begin to excavate it? And what is that impulse that then says, there's a part of this equation that has to do with coming forward and out and saying, Hey, you and me, you and I, we, we're on this planet and this happened to me and did anything like this happen to you and can i be of help or can you help me or i don't mean to be this is all by way of saying i couldn't describe it totally except that i was called to write about it and then i was Mm -hmm. i was asked by whom by what by the universe by consciousness by it's crazy to me I'm crazy. I, when I was mm. first doing, I said, I'm not going to get up and talk about having my dick sucked when I was 12. That's fuck. Who's going to want to, f- that's crazy. Crazy. Mm. It turned into an off Broadway show. You know, it's just crazy. And that's right. all to say it, it was me showing up to do my part. And I really, really mean this. It was something that ha- was meant to be. That was something that wanted to come through. And Right. It's like the love connection to others becomes part of the love connection to the self, to the, to the, you know, not that I know what I'm doing or not that I, but it's just, I could either honor it or not. I think honoring the calling is, you know, I'm just going to say it. Yeah, I honored it. And I'm proud of that because it was, you know, it was a lot of sitting down and writing and it was a lot of agonizing work and it brought me huge joy and it brought me a kind of, power and a, you know, a power in a good sense. It resonates with me because I think that, you know, the, the kind of abuse we went through is about silencing you as a child. It's about like, you don't have any power and you need to be quiet. So I think that there's, it's therapeutic to write about it. It's therapeutic to speak about it. Like you exercise acknowledging that ha- there's something deep inside the brain. I feel like that there's therapy in speaking about it. There's therapy in writing about it and acknowledging it. You're, you're kind of taking the power back and that even, you know, it's just vocalizing it is such a huge part of the healing process. So, you know, when you say like we're being called to it, I feel like that's part of it. It's, it's healing to mm-hmm. speak about it. It's healing to write about it because you were shut down for so long. You were silenced for yeah. so long. And that just plays out in the rest of your life. Like being silenced and shut out affects mm. you so much in all other areas of your life. So being able to express it, being able to find the right words, you know, words are so powerful. Being able to find those words to describe what's going on or what happened, that's healing yeah. in and of itself. And whether you call it art or a, or a piece of theater or a journal or a conversation with a friend, it's, it's the, right. it's, yeah. you know, only connect as Forrester, you know, the great writer always said, and I, I, 
I think, you know, the mystery part of it to me too, is that that silencing you talk about James, that aloneness is also a mm-hmm. place from which we, 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 ex- we suffer experiencing ourselves as utterly separate from anyone else mm. or from others. And the, the, the longer I'm alive and I'm, I sense this with you guys, the, the more deeply one awakens to our interdependence, to the, the, to the absolute truth mm. that we are one being, we are one organism. The ground of being is yeah. the planet. The, the, the universe, the star. And now I don't want to get too, you know, esoteric here, but the, you know, I am you, you are me. We, we, mm-hmm. and it's through this pain, through this journey, it's, it's like the imperative to, to heal the pain, to suffer less is the imperative of waking up to that you know, we're in some kind of divine situation here. We're spirits embodied. Yeah. And these things happen to us as a lot of things are happening. You know, people in the Ukraine are, and, 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 and Syria all over. It, it's, it's an incredible thing on this planet. We, we are so beautiful and capable of such beauty and we're violent or we, I, these things happen mm-hmm. and waking to love somehow waking to connecting is consciousness i think is calling us to toward love and the portal through which we've been called through a lot happens to be a really searing one i think when we were young the this incredibly intense thing happened and here we are sorting it out and it it is in fact the human experience please join us for part two of our conversation with martin moran this is from trauma to triumph